Well, good morning, everybody. I just wanted to start off today again with some satellite data because I really feel as though what we're seeing here in yesterday's satellite imagery really is kind of revealing where this pattern is, is going. And it's important to know this because during the middle of summer, we often have very weak teleconnections. In other words, you notice I haven't been showing you a lot of the MJO as of late. I haven't been showing you a lot of the other major teleconnections that happen across like the North Atlantic, the North Pacific going into the Arctic. And that's because they typically have very, very weak correlation uh, this time of year with our pattern. So we just have to observe the way the flow is going and talk about persistence in it and what typically happens in summer. So as we play this and just look at yesterday as the sun was setting, a couple things to take note of. You're going to notice a lot of flow like this in the west, okay? You're going to see the flow coming around like this over parts of the central United States and then rebounding in this direction uh, across the east. And what we've got developing right now is a sizable trough that is over the Great Lakes, over the uh, Hudson Bay, over the Canadian archipelago, getting, you know, almost over to parts of eastern Canada, but it's having difficulty getting much farther to the east because there's a large ridge here. We talked a lot last week about these flanking U.S. ridges, but we also have to contend with the fact that the ridge that's been over Texas is beginning to open up into the west, and there's some concern about that and what it could do to the heat over the west and what it also does to the development of these thunderstorms that pop on the heat of the day and run up top the mountains. Some of them produce a lot of lightning that uh, uh, starts wildfires. And so while this has been a, a spring and summer, we've talked a lot about Canadian wildfires, and you can see the smoke from the Canadian wildfires still here. We're going to have to start talking about the West uh, at this point. One neat thing to see is look at the storms that popped here in Minnesota yesterday in the middle of all that smoke. I just find that fascinating. And there is a front digging right in through here. Okay, on radar, just take a look at the last uh, 12 hours or so here uh, as an animation. And I know a lot of you have heard about the uh, excessive flooding that's happened in parts of New England. Uh, some of these storms just trained over the top of one another. The boundary was nearly stationary. In other words, not, not moving west or east, north or south. So the storms were just running over the top of it, delivering some incredibly heavy rainfall here. Across the south, very heavy rainfall. Here's that front I just mentioned in some of the storms in Minnesota. We just watch the west kind of light up here as the flow goes around this broader ridge. And that's, that's going to be a mainstay of the discussion of the weather forecast, I think, through the month of July. Looking at precipitation totals, I should have a new map here. Let's go look. This is just turned 6 o'clock. There we go. We can see the last 72 hours of total accumulated precip. And just to make a point here, there are parts of Pennsylvania, New York, getting up to like Vermont, New Hampshire, that have picked up just in the last three days, some places well over six inches of rainfall. And you might be hearing a lot in the news about 500-year rainfall events, 1,000-year rainfall events. Those are all um, statistical analyses of how heavy the rain is. So in other words, when we see some of these big events, we talk about the, the fact that it has you know, um, a one in a thousand chance of happening in any given year. So that's what that means. It doesn't mean that there hasn't been one for a thousand years. It just means that the probability of getting that much rain over a given time period is, is one in a thousand. We've seen heavy rains this past weekend over parts of the south and mid-south. We've seen them here in, in Oklahoma as well. In fact, I'm going to go pull this up real quick. I didn't take a close look at the hail this weekend. But yeah, this is the last three days. So I saw a lot of folks talking about this, just very large hail once again on the western plains, getting down to the southern plains here, and certainly showing up here in, in the radar data, uh, giving us those hail estimates. All right, if we look back at the last 30 days, so June 11th through June 9th, we're looking now at precipitation ranks. A couple of areas of concern. When will the southwestern monsoon, or will the southwestern monsoon develop? Will we start to fill in some of these holes that have been missed out on some of the heavier precipitation as of late? We need to talk about where the Texas Ridge goes next, what happens in parts of the Pacific Northwest, and do we continue to stay wet in these corridors that have been extremely wet as this deeper trough develops north of the Great Lakes toward the Hudson Bay? Now, a little more granulated look at this goes to the um, uh, this map here, which is down to four kilometer resolution. It's the AHPS data. As I've said in the past, it's always got a one day lag for quality control. Uh, but we can see here compared to normal what the precipitation has looked like. And we just have a few areas that really need to begin to fill in here throughout the Midwest, uh, getting down to the Missouri uh, Basin. Notice parts of Texas along the Gulf Coast are very dry, a real lack of any sort of hint of a southwestern monsoon. And throughout parts of like the Willamette Valley, getting into the central parts of Oregon uh, to the Columbia Basin up towards Spokane, this is an area that has missed out on a lot of its normal June storms. Um, they've been there, but they've not been as wide a coverage. So this is really impacting a lot of the crops grown in the Pacific Northwest uh, right now. 
But a lot of other folks have picked up some very heavy rainfall as of late. And yes, it's coming with quite a bit of severe weather in this area. But we're going to have questions as to whether or not we fill in these particular uh, spots at this point. One quick note, if you remember last week on Thursday we were talking, the high res NAM produced that low that was forecast to go through here. But I said don't, don't count on it. Uh, that system never materialized. So that just shows you how hard it is, what the models struggle with this time of year with developing off of uh, precipitation, off of these just very weak characteristics in the atmosphere. We're talking about little short waves, very ill-defined fronts. Um, to be honest, as a meteorologist, it is much easier to forecast in winter in North America. But let's get back to what we're dealing with this summer. I'm going to link this again uh, just so you have access to it. Uh, what I've done here is I've gone to, in fact, let me refresh it just to show anybody that's never seen this before. This is one of my favorite websites from NASA. Uh, it just shows us um, we're kind of monitoring NDVI values, so the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index. It basically uses satellite data to look down both in the red and the near infrared and compares those two values. And it turns out that that is a good indicator of plant health. So what we're going to do is we're going to come over here and click on Administration Level 1 or Admin Level 1, which breaks us down by state. You can also see the Canadian provinces here. Now, speaking of those Canadian provinces, we know that there is drought that has been developing. The crop had been ahead of schedule, and it has been very dry. So just as an example, in Saskatchewan, they've come off of this peak of NDVI values, and the drought is beginning to show up. Now, you know it's still above average, but given the dry conditions as of late, this is going to be something that's going to continue to change going forward. We know that over the last 11 or 12 days, uh, for example, parts of Iowa uh, getting into Illinois have seen some uh, large storm clusters that have gone through. And the NDVI values have shot up here compared to the historical averages. And so we're going to talk in a few moments about how the moisture is going to continue across this area and into a state that desperately needs it, which is Missouri. We'll see where the drier conditions are going to be, but I just want to tell you to go to the site, click on your state, and have a close look. In fact, you can zoom out and look anywhere in the world that you want to uh, using this particular tool from NASA. It's a great one. But speaking of global views, I want to come down to the big things that we need to be monitoring. This has really been an interesting uh, change in the ocean temperatures as of the last 30 days. A lot of warm water has built in here. It is almost negating the fact that there's still this negative PMM, which is the Pacific Meridiana mode. That's the cold water here. And what this warm water is doing is it's nosing towards British Columbia as it's really being disruptive of the flow here, causing it to slow down, allowing for more ridges to build into the west. And right now it seems as though this is winning the competition over the PMM. El Nino just continues to develop. The very warm Atlantic is a strong signal. And just to show you how warm it is in the Atlantic, again, we have ocean temperatures right now that have at times been past the peak, uh, a, a typical ocean temperature uh, you know, pattern uh, in, in the middle of hurricane season. So it's that much warmer than, than the climatological average. You probably heard a lot in the news lately about how warm it is off of Florida. I'd like to show you the data. Now, this is in degrees Celsius. So remember, 30 degrees Celsius is 86. 32.1, that is 90, 90 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you notice, right here along this part of Florida, we have got ocean temperatures that are in the 90s, 90 degree water. And this whole very warm area and the contribution of something called the loop current, which comes in like this, could be very important to understanding tropical cyclone development later on. We don't have anything right now we're keeping an eye on, but just be very aware that the ocean is primed in the Gulf of Mexico, in the Atlantic, in the Caribbean for the development of, of a rapid development of tropical systems going forward. But the other side, coming over to the Pacific Ocean, go right to the central equatorial Pacific. We call that Nino region 3.4. We've just continued to see a steady kind of progress upward in terms of ocean temperatures. And in tonight's in-depth report, we're going to take a look at those longer range projections because I got them now from the NMME. I got them from the European model. We can take a look at what the Bureau of Meteorology is suggesting, but we're going to watch to see if these ocean temperatures could add another degree in the central equatorial Pacific. We're already kind of getting a bit of El Nino look from, um, you know, from the current kind of changes we've seen in the last month or so. And what I'm talking about there is this, troughs in this area. You see today, um, when you look at the flow pattern in the upper levels of the atmosphere, we have this broader trough that's just sitting right here over and just to the west of, of you know, the Hudson Bay. There's just flow dipping to the south across much of the east while this ridge begins to open up and take up more space in the western United States. Got weak little waves coming through the Pacific Northwest, 
But overall, this is not the, the, the setup we typically see if we're going to keep the west cool. We have a large ridge that's here pushing into the North Atlantic and just almost split flow across the western United States or western North America. And I think this is going to be something we're going to talk a lot about in the coming days and weeks. Now, the upper level flow, which is seen here. So this is a map of jet stream level winds as forecast by the European model. This is where I think we're seeing this, this El Nino influence. You see, as I play through Wednesday into Thursday, we've got this piece of the subtropical jet that's kind of joining up with the weaker polar jet here at times and just really accelerating over this ridge that's developing here. And it's this corridor throughout this week and into next week that we have to just continue to watch for these clusters of storms because there's support on the back side of this low there's a low sitting here to just keep the momentum going now if you remember back in may and june we were talking about no momentum here there was just no flow all the flow came into the west or it was way off to the east now this is now a shifted pattern we now see much better flow there's still indications of things splitting across you know western north america but whenever you see jet stream flow coming in like this, that is a pretty good sign that El Nino's got a little bit better of a handle on this pattern than it has had in the past. So what it means is over the next seven days, latest update from the WPC kind of keeps an open storm corridor right in through here. And this is one of the areas that we needed to see fill in that's beginning to fill in. Some of the heavy rains that continue in this area today uh, of major concern still have this weak low that's exiting here into parts of New England capable of delivering uh, excessive rainfall. But uh, this inner contour here is an inch and a half, and this would be hitting that kind of one of my last few holdouts of very, very dry weather. So this is going to be some critical rain. Now, the rain forecast for Missouri last week very much underperformed. The models were overpredictive which means we need to just watch this carefully because Missouri, of course, is one of our last regions in through here that has been very dry. So when does the upper Midwest begin to fill this in? Well, let's go have a look at the overall forecast going forward. All right, this is um, today's all hazards weather map early this morning. Dense fog here, flood watches out for New England, excessive heat from Florida to Texas into New Mexico. And then this is the beginning of a change. This is excessive heat watches and warnings and red flag warnings here for parts of the Columbia Basin. So on satellite, the main core, excuse me, not on satellite, uh, looking at the winds in, in the mid levels of the atmosphere, we have a broader area of high pressure kind of funneling into this frontal boundary that's going to stretch right in through here. It's very weak, but it will be along this boundary today that we have the risk for the strong to severe storms. So the Storm Prediction Center's got a pretty large area identified here from Texas through much of the central plains into the western Corn Belt all the way up into the upper Midwest. The storms in Montana, there's a low that's curling through here today. It could deliver some stronger storms out of Idaho into Montana. And then into New England, we're going to watch as well. Tomorrow, it'll be the influence of that front that you saw coming in like this. It's now going to dip farther to the south, increase the risk in parts of uh, Nebraska, excuse me, getting over into Iowa, possibly clipping into northern Illinois, or excuse me, northern Missouri. I got my states backwards this morning. And then tomorrow, we're going to talk about Illinois, Missouri. This is where the risk is going to be uh, on the 12th. So before I go into uh, the kind of the models here again, I want to show you just a website. I'll link this one down at the bottom as well. Uh, the Weather Prediction Center also puts out um, this great uh, series of maps that show over the next few days where the risk of excessive precipitation is. So here's today, all right, going into tomorrow. This would be uh, on Tuesday into Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. So you have this, this one week outlook of, of where the heaviest rains are possibly gonna be. And I just want you to go around and play around with the website. You can of course move around and zoom on this and take closer looks at different areas. Please take advantage of it. But our models right now, let's just go have a look at the NAM. So playing through today, here's your storms in the Northeast causing the flooding. We have the isolated storm events that are going to stretch from the coastal Carolinas down through the south. There's the low curling up over Spokane and the storms around Idaho and Montana we mentioned. But as we go into tomorrow, see the front sagging? There it is. This is tonight, getting into tomorrow. And we're going to watch these storm clusters begin to orient themselves where they're coming in this direction across the country. And that's showing up well in the European model forecast. This is just playing out over a week. If I go back, you can see the, the way that the atmosphere, the deeper low of the Hudson Bay, the ridge building in the west is just sending those storms right into this corridor. 
Now, if you remember way back into April and, or excuse me, May and June, we had Northwest flow, but the air was very dry coming in here, okay, in, in the upper levels. And that's what we were missing out on. Then that massive ridge built here. So the wind came out of the other direction. Well, we don't have either of those things anymore. We have our typical summer Northwest flow building these storms into the unstable air. We just play it out there a week, and this is where we end up. Compared to the GFS, this is what you get. European GFS, very similar overall patterns. There's always going to be differences in the amounts in summer, but you can see that they at least pick up on the same key features overall. Probability maps, though, really give us the full story, so this is the best chance at getting over an inch of precipitation, and I'm keying in right into this corridor here. This has been that holdout for, for, for dry conditions. Next 10 days. So where do we see the new dry area setting up here and then throughout the west? In fact, the probability of getting less than half of an inch is shown uh, in, this, in this graphic. There will be isolated storms that are going to pop as this ridge opens up. And the model can't find them. It's not capable of seeing that. So there will be some locally heavy rain from some isolated storms inside of the ridge that's opening up here but it's not showing up uh, in this forecast. So I just want to show you this. Keep an eye on the CPC website later today. They're going to update this map. This is one they released on Friday. They don't release them over the weekend. But it was talking about the risk of the 15th through the 21st of very heavy rainfall in this corridor. We just need to watch to see if that continues to show up. Because when you look out there a little bit beyond that, this would be the uh, 17th through the 23rd, we notice that the ridge as it builds is really showing a dry signal here for so much of the west but will we get those thunderstorms cascading over the top and does it continue to stay wet up the east coast we can see that in the european the uh, european is a bit drier in here but it's probably not resolving the, the the storms that run over the ridge the gfs has always been a bit wetter with it here but still has its very strong dry bias uh, over the uh, southeast Okay, let's finish this up by looking at temperatures here. Here's today's highs as we play through this week. This is now getting out there until Tuesday, and then this is Wednesday and Thursday. We had some data loss here in southern Wisconsin from the National Weather Service. That's why there's that white spot there. But notice the heat that's in Texas. We're going to get some hot days here coming in uh, by Wednesday into parts of Kansas and Missouri. But then watch the west. This is Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Look at the heat building into the western United States. That's why we've got these successive heat watches and warnings going into place here. That seems to be where the pattern wants to stay. As I play you through the next 10 days, this is a five-day sliding window of average temperature anomalies. Just notice kind of this boundary. If you're south of this, the risk of heat is really going up. While we're going to buy time through maybe the beginning of the third week of July with, uh, with cooler temperatures here. But there are some indications that that fades. And as we get out here toward like that third week of July and beyond, we start to see the risk of more widespread heat across the United States. Now, this is uh, up in the air. There's not strong signals out to this point as to whether or not we're going to truly see excessive heat late in the time period. But uh, certainly between now and then, if you're south of this line I'm drawing here, uh, the heat will, will definitely be on. All right. This is the newest update uh, from the CPC on the risk of excessive or hazardous temperatures. So I think we're going to continue to see them kind of painting this region going forward throughout this week, giving us their long-range forecast on where to expect the, the risk to be. Okay, in tonight's in-depth report, we're going to be talking about the newest updates, the seasonal updates from the European model, looking out there into late summer, early fall, what it means with respect to the southwestern monsoon, the potential for this tropical cyclone season, how does uh, you know grain fill go for, for much of the Midwest, and uh, what are we seeing here in terms of uh, just overall habits in the atmosphere with respect to um, El Nino and other factors. And we'll compare that to the new NMME, which has a very similar outlook. Okay, so plenty to talk about in tonight's end of the report. I look forward to giving you that one. And until then, have a good rest of your day. Thanks.